You know that old saying that a hero is only as good as their villain? It's not an absolute fact, but having a fascinating antagonist that truly challenges a main character physically, mentally, or ideologically can do wonders for making that journey unforgettable. The Batman franchise is no stranger to this concept, with many of the Dark Knight's greatest stories explicitly revolving around a member of his rogues gallery, their inner conflicts and worldviews, and how they reflect the man determined to stop them. But riddle me this. What do a clown, a disfigured attorney, a scarecrow, and the rest of Gotham's most wanted have in common? Have a taste for the theatrical, like you. Almost all of them have their own eccentricities or a message that they want to impart to let the world and its greatest detective know who they are and how they think the world works. But Gotham's a big city. Surely there's someone out there with a dark side, but without the need to make such a big show of it. Theoretically, it could be anyone. I don't consider myself a bad person. On the whole, I consider myself a good person. But I've decided that just once I want to do a really bad thing. I mean a really seriously bad thing. An Innocent Guy is a Batman short story written and illustrated by Brian Bolland, a comic book artist known especially for illustrating the graphic novel Batman the Killing Joke, which has practically become the definitive Joker origin story that so many adaptations take at least a little influence from. When the chips are down, these, uh, these civilized people, they'll eat each other. So this guy's had a pretty prolific career as an artist, but from this story he shows that he has a fair amount of talent in the writer's room as well. It was initially published in the anthology series Batman Black and White, with a full coloured version being printed in the 2008 edition of The Killing Joke. An Innocent Guy consists of a monologue from a young man who seems to live an unassuming and mild-mannered life. I'm good to my parents, I treat my girl right, and I go to church every Sunday. We see him venting to his video camera about certain fantasies that he apparently plans on acting out. He talks about wanting to kill someone and create a little bit of misery in the world. Not for money, not for power, not out of some extremist sense that it's the right thing to do, pretty much just for the experience of it. I thought I'd kidnap a little girl and chain her up and leave her there weeping and wailing in the dark till she starved to death. Whatever I can do to make her ordeal worse and ruin the lives of her family, I'll do." You can tell early on that this is a very different kind of Batman story. There's no large-scale master plan to uproot Gotham with laughing gas or freeze the city with a giant laser cannon. It's just a realistic depiction of a normal but deeply disturbed individual with the supposed intent to do things that real-life psychopaths and killers actually do. And while we have no reason to suspect he would hurt anyone in his personal life because, as he puts it, getting caught is not on my agenda, the idea that he has parents and a girlfriend that love and closely associate with him, not knowing what goes on inside his head, is unsettling. Bolin's artwork also really helps to convey this guy's psychological state. Physically, he looks relatively harmless and unintimidating, but maybe a little too much so, like he's got something to hide and the slightly exaggerated facial expressions he makes conveys a sense of pent-up aggression that he's frustratedly trying to keep in, as well as some sadistic pleasure from what he's describing. I think the original black and white version has an advantage in this regard, as the lack of any vibrant or flashy colours that you might expect from a superhero comic gets replaced with this uncanny and lifeless looking figure against a shadowy void. It gives it a slightly more grounded and ominously real mood. The monologue plays out with some of the descriptions of the terrible things he'd like to do to an innocent person. But somehow this isn't enough. Not content with destroying a few people, he decides he wants to hurt the entire world, killing the most prominent symbol of hope and good that he feels is within his power. It's gotta be the Batman. His monologue continues playing over an imagined montage of comparatively traditional Batman stories and the typical villains he faces. And this sequence does a fantastic job of demonstrating how meaningful Batman is for the people of Gotham, apparently including the man who plans to kill him. It does this through elements like the poetic ways he describes the encounters, describing Batman like a hero of legend. Striking terror into the hearts of the guilty. One day he'll be face to face with Two-Face, or he'll be tangling with Poison Ivy. He even kind of takes a jab at the overly elaborate ways that these villains tried to take down Batman compared to how he plans to do it. A thrilling chase involving an enormous typewriter or something. 
And as much as I praised the black and white version before, the colored version I think is where this particular section really shines. The glossy and highly saturated color palette is great at capturing the more fantastical side of Batman, which contrasts with the more faded out colors of the young man, juxtaposing the mood of the two scenes. Although, as far as I can tell, the re-release doesn't make any changes to the story outside of the color palette. Oh, and this one line from Batman where he now says Umbrella instead of Brawly, which is probably for the best because I don't know about you, but I can't really see Batman saying that. But what do I know? Maybe more Batman media could benefit from some British slang thrown in. I could have had it away with his cracking Judy, my old China. Are you telling pork pies in a bag of tripe? Because if you are feeling quiggly, why not just have a J. Arthur? What, Billy, no, mates? Too right, you. Don't you remember the crimbo din din we had with the grotty scotch bin? Oh, the one that was all sixes and sevens. Yeah, yeah, yeah she was a traveling stripe, but a Morris dancer lived up the apples of pear. Enough from the clown. Either way, though, the young man finishes his story of Batman apprehending a villain and having a moment to take satisfaction in the fact that Gotham is now a safer city thanks to his heroic efforts. And then... And he'll be dead. This is probably the most impactful image of the comic. After an entire sequence depicting Batman overcoming obstacles like a giant bear trap and an umbrella that shoots bullets, this sudden, coldly realistic image of such an icon taking a bullet through the skull, his very last instant of consciousness being a feeling of shock and pain is chilling to see. As is the aftermath of his dead body bleeding out onto the ground below with this dark, almost inhuman silhouette of the young man standing over him. This is another instance where I have to give the edge to the coloured version of this scene. The bright red blood creates such a shocking and striking contrast between the more muted colours of the rest of the scene, really letting you feel the gravity of the situation. And the grisly display we've just witnessed is all the more impactful following the more exaggerated and over-the-top scenarios immediately before it. In fact, as much as I really don't like the theatrical cut of Justice League, I can't help but think of this line. One misses the days when one's biggest concerns were exploding wind-up penguins. The story ends with the young man giving his thoughts on what he'll do after that. I think I'll finish my college education, marry my girlfriend, and have a couple of kids. Live a good and blameless life and go to heaven when I die. It's not really clear what actually happens after this story. I sincerely doubt he would actually kill Batman. For one thing, he'd have to be pretty lucky to find him, not to mention much more dangerous people have tried and failed to do the exact thing he's proposing. Maybe he will settle for kidnapping a little girl or some other apparently not significant enough crime. Maybe he'll just decide that nothing's ever going to come from his fantasies and just live his life. But the idea that he's content to murder Batman and then just move on as normal is, I think, the most evil part of it all. As far as he's concerned, he satisfied himself and that's all that matters. The damage he's done to the world around him, the countless people who would undoubtedly die due to Batman's absence, even his plan to bring more people into the world to love him despite not knowing who he really is and what he's capable of, all of that he's at best indifferent towards and at worst genuinely pleased. I love stories like this because it's a great way of fleshing out the DC universe as a whole. Some of the best Batman stories I've consumed are ones that actually treat Gotham like a living, breathing world, not just a collection of buildings for Batman to stand in front of while he punches people. And an effective way of doing that can be to tell some stories from the perspective of Gotham's everyday citizens. The ones that don't typically get involved in the extravagant adventures that Batman goes on and are mostly just living normal lives. It can be a great insight into the city that Batman has sworn to protect, and also how his presence affects it culturally. Don't get me wrong, I'll gladly accept a more out there Batman plot if you've got one, but there is room for a little grim reality. Even if it doesn't always work. I got the sneaking suspicion that we're not giving the people what they want. I'm writing this not long after seeing Joker Folly Adieu, and while that's a story for another video, I think the negative reviews are justified. Sadly, we live in a society where even a bad movie that bombs at the box office can still garner more attention than a genuinely smart and in-depth look at the more real side of the DC Universe. My advice if you were disappointed with Joker 2, better media like it is out there. You just have to know where to look. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters Heather Reed and Zelda. Thank you so much for the support.